Matthew eleven two through 6. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Welcome to Kish. Thanks for coming. My name is Drex. Um, if you're new here and you've never heard me, uh, had the pleasure of hearing me speak before, um, let me uh, let you know what to expect. Um, Kish is blessed with a robust congregation. Um, with that robust congregation comes some struggles. Um, some capacity issues that uh, the elder board has been wrestling through for a long-term solution. But in the meantime, when we see the auditorium getting full, the plan is that I will preach. <laughs> because when I preach, um, I typically say something offensive, and some people don't come back. Um, so if I offend you today, I'm sorry. Um, I'm a sinner, um, and God's working on my heart. And if you come back next week and you have an easier time finding a seat, you're welcome. <laughs> so on another note, while I have a captive audience, um, let me give you a free lesson on dementia. So if you don't know, I work in Memory Lane of Valley View. It's a dementia unit. If you want to have a bad day on Memory Lane, then come with some expectations. If you're on your way to Memory Lane and you're in the car, and you already have your good day planned out, you're going to have a bad day. Because my, my hall um, won't live up to those preconceived expectations. Not only will you set yourself up for a bad day, you'll miss out the good day. You know, it's not fair to my residents to put those expectations on them. But the saddest part, it's not fair to you either, because you'll miss out on that good day that's there. I firmly believe that every day has a good day waiting to be found. You just need to look at it. But if you've narrowed your definition to a good day, to a strict set of expectations, then you're never going to ha have that good day on memory lane. Dementia is too fluid, too organic, too unpredictable. But I hear you. You don't work on memory lane. You work in the real world. You're, you don't have dementia. Well, if that's kind of what you're thinking, that you live in the real world, you don't work on a dementia unit, you work with normal people, then you don't understand dementia. There are very few dementia issues or behaviors. There are a lot of human issues and behaviors that are exasperated by a broken frontal lobe. The only difference between dementia issues and human issues is magnitude. And if you go through life with that strict set of expectations that what defines good circumstances, then you're going to struggle. Life's too unpredictable, too fluid, and too organic. God's plan is way too big to be limited by our expectations from our demented, finite brains. All right. Dementia lesson's over. Um... In the scripture that Hayden just read, we find John sitting in prison, and John's thinking one question. Before I go on, like, to me, when Luke asked about maybe filling in a Sunday and kind of this sermon series of kind of people and their experience with Jesus, John's kind of like the first one I thought of, because he's one of those people in the Bible that I kind of want to know a little more about. Um, you know, we have these tidbits um, probably more than a lot of people in the Bible, but I still want to know a little more. He's just so different and so unique. You know, so we find him sitting in prison, thinking, and his thinking's just led to a question. And that question is this, did I put my faith in the right person? But before we get to the question, let's talk about John and how he got himself in this mess. Every good story needs a flashback. Just to warn you, my thinking's not that structured. 
So we may have some flash forwards, some flash sideways. So hang on, this is about to get bumpy. Um, so John was born to respective family, respected elderly couple. His mother, before becoming pregnant with John, was thought to be unable to have children. His father, a priest, was the strong and silent type. John first meets Jesus while they're both still in the womb. It says, John leaped in the womb. My gut says to some level, sensing his cousin's presence, John got excited. I'm thinking he already knew of his great purpose, and he was thinking, it's on like Donkey Kong. With all the strange circumstances surrounding John's birth, a name that, uh, surrounding his birth and his conception, a name that no one other than his parents liked, it's no wonder that John's family became the local gospel. But if those neighbors thought that John's conception and birth were odd, then John was about to give them a lesson on the depths of oddity. Because John definitely lived an odd life. Some even call him a freak. His clothing, his food, where he lived, all odd. Until he's about 30, he's living in the, will, in the wild, eating bugs, reading scripture. But the most odd thing was his message. A message of repentance and forgiveness of sin through, symbolized in baptism. A message that pointed out the hypocrisy of the religious and political leaders of his time. I agree with DC talk. He was definitely a freak but a freak with a purpose, a dangerous freak with a purpose sent by God. So what was John's purpose? To prepare the way for Christ, to go before and till some soil. We're called Christians because we follow the Christ. John had the honor and huge responsibility of going ahead of Christ. I can't even imagine that. If someone would come up to me and tell me their job was to go before Christ and prepare the people I think, wow, that's an arrogant person. I can't even keep up with Jesus. And John was out in front preparing the path for Jesus. Then equally important was his responsibility to step aside when Christ showed up. John had such a prestigious job. Heck, the prophet Isaiah was singing his praises 700 years before he was even started his work. But even though John was the greatest among those born a woman, he wasn't the rock star. He wasn't Christ. John's great humility gave him the ability, once Jesus came onto the scene, to step aside and to drift off into obscurity. And that's where we find him. That leads us back to a cold, dark prison cell and a man with a question. Can you blame him? He's John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin. He sacrificed the comforts of life, abstained from life's pleasures, all to preemptively prepare the people for the coming of the Messiah. Then, in humility, he decreased his ministry so that people would not be confused by who is the Messiah. My gut tells me John wasn't expecting fanfare, but at the same time, I bet he wasn't expecting to end up in a cool, dark prison. For a man that spent his whole life off the land, living out in the wild, free as can be, How could he not be depressed with his current circumstances? Then there were those expectations of the Messiah. John said he baptized with water, but the one that would come would baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. John told the religious leaders of his day that they were like a tree that had an axe poised and ready to cut their root. And if they did not start bearing fruit, that they would be thrown into fire. John's picture of the Messiah was one with power and justice. John's Messiah would come with a pitchfork to gather the repentant into his house while burning the unrepentant with unquenchable fire. So when John hears of Jesus eating and drinking at a wedding, hanging out in the homes of sinners, John John didn't see God's kingdom come. John didn't see any justice. He was in this mess because he offended King Herod by calling out his immorality and injustice and preaching that his successor was here. Things didn't add up in John's mind. So he sent some of his followers to Jesus with an odd question. Are you the Messiah or should we wait for another? 
The first thing that seems odd to me about this question is if you had a list of all the people that know the answer to this question, John would have been high on the list. He was full of the Holy Spirit. And upon, upon seeing Jesus, he declared, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then after Jesus is baptized, John witnesses the Spirit of God descend on Christ, which is when John hears the voice of God said, You are my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. At this point, there is no one, with the exception of maybe Mary, who better, is a better witness to John's deity. John gets to ask Jesus one question. And he asks a question that he already knows the answer to. If you got one question to ask Christ, what's your question? The second thing thing that seems odd to me about the question is the answer. Or should I say the non-answer? Jesus answered, Go and tell John what you hear. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up. And the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. He never answers the question directly. Everyone can see that John's struggling, but no one more than Jesus, who had the ability to see John's heart. No one would have answered John's question this way. Jesus didn't try and convince him of his deity, nor did Jesus just say, oh, sorry, John, I forgot about you. I'll be right there to bust you out. Maybe that's what John was hoping. After all, he heard about everyone else's prayers getting answered. Why should he be left in such a state? Jesus doesn't even speak one word to comfort John's obvious despair. Jesus knew John was struggling with doubt. But Jesus also knew who John was. Jesus knew that John had a fiery passion for the kingdom of God and an equally powerful hatred of evil. Jesus knew that among those born of women, there was none greater than John. Jesus knew exactly what John needed to hear. Jesus answered with a good bit of truth and a small loving rebuke. The truth reminded John what he already knew. The loving rebuke shined some some needed light on the root of John's despair. Blessed is the one not offended by me. Ouch. Christ hadn't lived up to John's expectations. John was offended by Christ. Satan had used those expectations to plant a dark seed of doubt in John's heart. With that rebuke, Christ fired a shot of light at that dark seed. When John asked Jesus, was he worthy? Christ said, damn right I am. We don't know what John was thinking when the executioner showed up with the axe and the platter. But my gut tells me that John stood tall, accepting his end, knowing that his great work was done. The kingdom of God had come, and he could now rest. Knowing that light always pushes away darkness, and knowing Jesus' crazy sniper skills with light, mix that with John's exceptional character, I'm very confident When the axe was descending, there was no longer any doubt in John's heart. I'm confident that John was content in his circumstances due to his satisfaction that rested in Jesus Christ. John found his good day because John's good day rested and was rooted in Christ. So I got four thoughts. One superficial and three a little bit deeper. Number one, living in a culture that is not of a biblical worldview. Maybe you think the culture in John's day and our culture are different. Maybe you're right, especially on the surface. But maybe, you know, maybe unlike John's time when Jesus had to come and clarify a biblical worldview, you believe we live in a culture founded on one clear biblical worldview. Maybe unlike John's time, where justice was handed out differently depending on who you were and what class you were in, our justice system is blind and fair. Maybe unlike John's time, when the political leaders were corrupt and self-serving, 
You think our political leaders are above reproach and always do what's in the best interest of the people. Maybe unlike John's time, when a passionate follower of Jesus was considered a freak, in our time, a passionate follower of Jesus will be considered um, for the cover of Time magazine. Or maybe, like me, you think that even though John's time and our time look different, on the surface, they're both very similar and have the same evil heart. If I'm right, don't be surprised if sooner or later, if you need to make a choice, do you want to be accepted in our culture or do you want to be labeled a freak for passionately following Christ? Or even worse, be thrown in prison for that passion. I only got one word of solace for you, if I'm right, that you'll be in good company because some of the coolest people I read in the Bible are ex-cons. Okay, point number two. Dangers of expectations. John was struggling because his life didn't turn out the way he expected it. And the Messiah didn't live up to his expectations. John's failed expectations were getting the best of him. Satan was using John's expectations to turn John's normal human doubt into a doubt of Christ. John was great, but he was still human. And any human that finds himself sitting in prison and doesn't have some self-reflectance caused by doubt is either brain dead or an idiot. John's issue was where he focused his doubt. Do you, like John, have expectations? Are your failed expectations robbing you of your joy and your purpose? Is your marriage not living up to your expectations? Are you thinking, maybe I should look for another? Maybe you're missing out on the good marriage because you're not willing to drop those expectations. Maybe you have some too high expectations of your spouse. I don't know. Is your job not living up to your expectations? Are you thinking maybe you should look for another? Maybe you're missing out on God's purpose for you at work. Maybe your purpose isn't to be happy at work. Maybe it's to do something to uh, further the kingdom. Is your church not living up to your expectations? Are they not feeding you? Well, maybe you're the one that's supposed to be feeding. Do you have those expectations of those around you? Are they, not, are they people not living up to them? Are you thinking, maybe I need to find some new friends, some new people around me? Maybe you're missing out on the beauty of failure. Because some of the deepest relationships I have have got there through failure. Worst of all, is your finite mind's expectation planting seeds of doubt in God's infinite wisdom? I know expectation. I have divorce in my life. I'm 46. My body's falling apart. You know, I have to choose whether I can either see close up or far away because I'm too proud to go get bifocals. I have a belly that I never had before. Metamucil is now my friend. Like I said, I'm 46. And I'm going to have a little baby running around soon. So at least one thing on my body is working. Um, <laughs> I just put that in there to see if you're all still awake. Yeah. 20 years ago, if I would have... My life didn't turn out the way I thought it was going to be. If I look back, what I thought 20 years ago. But I don't spend any time focusing on that. Because I'll miss out on the beautiful life I have. God's plans are always better than ours. Is your good day rooted in Christ? If it is, God is omnipresent, so there's always a good day to be found. If your good day is rooted in the Messiah, then there's always comfort and strength to accept those failed expectations. If your good day is rooted in Christ, then you, like John, can stand tall and face the executioners in your life. Pain and suffering is coming. That's a given. If your good day is defined as the absence of pain, then you're going to miss some of the best days of your life because there's deep beauty in the struggle. Point number three. 
Why do we worship God? It's not overt, but I think it's there. When John asks if, he is the, if Jesus is the Messiah, he's really asking, why did I put my faith in you? Why did I dedicate my life to you, and why do I worship you? I believe that's John, what John's really asking, because that's how Jesus answers the question. Jesus doesn't say, John, I'm the Messiah, because I'm going to make you healthy, wealthy, and wise. Jesus doesn't say, John, I'm the, I'm the Messiah, because I'm going to come and save you. Jesus answers John's question by pointing out what John already knew. You worship me. I am the Messiah because I am the only thing worthy of worship. I am the only one capable of being the Messiah. I am. Why do you worship God? If salvation was off the table, would you still worship, should you still worship God? Would you? Do you think the gospel is just about salvation? God blesses us beyond understanding, but that isn't his mission. His mission is to bring his kingdom come and have his will be done. And that mission, that will, when done, will be our greatest day. Okay, last point. Prayer. I hope I don't come across as being too hard on John. I truly believe he's one of the coolest people I read about in the Bible. His fire, his passion, his willingness to be labeled a freak to follow Jesus. I believe Jesus when he says John is top-notch because I see it too. John was struggling, but don't we all? One final thing sticks out to me. It is John's great, in John's greatness, he does the smart thing. He takes his struggle to the Lord. Yeah, at first John's question seemed odd to me, but the more I think about it, the more I think it was the perfect question. John was smart. In his darkest time, he reached out to the one who would never let him down. It's true that there's great danger in expectations. There's equal danger in just pretending that everything's okay and that you're going to get through it. Satan can use that to darken our hearts just as easily. So don't pretend everything is fine. Follow John's example and take it to the Lord. Wrestle with God. Just protect your hip. Let them know you were hoping for a better outcome. Just don't be surprised if you get the sim, uh, answer similar to John or similar to Job or similar to Paul or similar to Jeremiah, David, and Moses. Pray that God will open your eyes to the good day hiding in the weeds of those failed expectations. If you still can't find it, just look to the foot of the cross. It's probably where they're waiting. I'm going to pray. Lord, thank you for the grace and the wisdom to drop those expectations. Give me the strength to lean into failed expectations and find the good day that you have planned for me. Thank you for the struggle. No pain, no gain. Thank you for the beauty therein. And thank you for the gospel that is all you, your kingdom and your will. Let my good day be rooted in you. Amen.